we can start the session. So welcome, welcome everybody to this session. The session is towards the governance of artificial intelligence in higher education, uh, a data justice framework and early lessons in practical implementation, where we have Dr. Katia Petinka, cultural anthropologist, excuse my pronunciation <laughs> of your name, cultural oh, anthropologist. Oh you, you will, you will um, uh, introduce yourself, Katia, please. So I I'll know. let you introduce yourself as you start the session. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Irene. Thank you for introduction. And um, I'll start sharing my screen and you can see my slides. So just a word of warning that once I go into my presenters mode, because I only have one screen, I'm, from, I'm working from home today, I won't be able to see you. So if you want to ask me some burning question during the presentation, please just interrupt. Um, if you want to, that's fine. Or put your questions in the chat, and I'll um, I'll check in with the chat um, occasionally, and definitely leave enough time in the end for for questions. Um, so I'll start share I'll start sharing my screen now. Hopefully, it all goes well. And let's do presenter mode. So hopefully, you can see my first slide. If not, please let me know. Um, yes. All right, it's all good. <laughs> Okay. All right. Um, well, thank you again. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very, very excited uh, to talk to be talking to you tonight, this morning for some of you. And uh, today I'll be talking about my current work in the area of governance of AI in higher education. And I'll be presenting uh, specifically uh, uh, on my data justice framework. And I'll be talking about some early lessons in practical implementation of the framework that is currently happening at my place of work at Swinburne University of Technology. So um, as Irene introduced uh, introduced me earlier, uh, my name is Katia Pachankina, so almost, almost got, got the last name right. Um, it's a bit of a difficult one to to pronounce. I'm a senior lecturer at, uh, at Swinburne University, so a senior lecturer in learning and teaching at uh, Learning Transformations Unit at Swinburne University of Technology, Australia. So you can see my email there on the bottom. And if you don't get to ask your question or if you think about something later that you want to talk to me about, please feel free to email me and I can share the slides uh, with you after the presentation. So before I get into my uh, presentation, I would like to acknowledge that I have conducted this research while living on the lands called Mary Beck, where the Wurundjeri were wrong people are the traditional owners. And also as I work research at, and teach at Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne, I would also like to acknowledge that our Hawthorne campus where I'm based is located on the ancestral lands of the Kul uh, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. These lands have never been ceded, and this always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Now, to give you a brief uh, outline of my presentation today, uh, I will talk about the context of this work, and I'll introduce <clears throat> the book um, in which I have a chapter, um, a book that came out last year uh, and which inspired this work. I will give you a very brief overview of uh, AI and higher education. I'm sure you all um know all these things, but I'll briefly touch on them before I move on to the actual framework part of the presentation. And I'll talk about uh, risks and challenges and paradoxes that we all encounter uh, in this in this area and in the whole discourse around AI and Gen AI specifically. And then I'll talk about the main um, scholarship pillars behind my work in this in this realm and it's ethics, privacy and data justice. That's gonna build up to my introduction of my um, piece de resistance, my data justice framework that I'm proposing and the principles that, um, that uh, come in as a way to operationalize it. And finally, I'll talk about the practical aspects of it and talk a little bit about the current work we're doing uh, with my colleagues at Swinburne, uh, basically trying to come up with uh, guidance, with practical guidance for our academics, for our colleagues that are about to start teaching this year. And then also briefly about where to next um, in this in this area and what to expect. So um, let's get started, uh, like I mentioned, by introducing context for this work. And it's great to have one of the co-editors of this book um, in the room with us, Catherine Croyen, uh, has co-edited this book called Higher Education for Good, 
Teaching and Learning Futures uh, with Laura Chernevich. Uh, so this book um, came to be uh, as, a, as, a great, um, as a great exercise in trying to think positively about various issues that affect higher education across contexts, across countries, across disciplines. So here you can see the guiding question uh, for all the chapters in the book um, formulated in this way. After decades of turbulence and acute crisis in recent years, how can we build a better future for higher ed? And um, various uh, people around the world, including myself, have been invited to think about positive ways because it's higher education for good. And I think um, as an academic and you know, my colleagues in universities, we, we have a tendency to critique. We love critiquing things, uh, but it's not always, um, it's difficult for us to, it's difficult for me to think about the positives of something that I'm biased against perhaps, and to think about uh, dif in a different way about these challenges and about ways to approach them, how to solve them. So. Uh, people came together for this book from across 17 countries, from diverse disciplines, very different backgrounds, practitioners, academics, um, even writers, uh, speculative. We have some speculative uh, fiction in this book as a way of reimagining the future. And we all came together um, to answer various questions of interest to us. So you can read this book now. It came out uh, last year. Uh, here is, you can see the QR code and the download link. So it's actually, you can read it for free and um, I welcome you to do it. Uh, my art, my uh, chapter, I took it as an opportunity to explore a topic that was of great interest to me at the time and still is. Um, and uh, that was all happening as Gen AI has entered uh, higher education and started changing things. And we all started panicking, trying to understand how it's going to affect our lives and our, our jobs and our teaching and learning practices. So as you can see from the title of my chapter, I'm asking a question, artificial intelligence for good. Because I'm not sure. And if you've read my chapter, if you're going to read it, you'll see that it's kind of a dialogue with myself. And I'm trying to reflect on things. I'm trying to um, kind of argue um, against my own biased opinions. <laughs> so um, three guiding questions um, are behind my chapter. So how can AI be used in higher education for good? How can we regulate this industry that's so rapidly growing, so rapidly evolving, that it's, it's very difficult to regulate something that's constantly changing every day? Um, as I was writing this chapter and I was working with the editors, uh, I think I had to rewrite uh, significant parts of it several times because things were happening and the industry was changing so rapidly that my chapter, we wanted to make sure we future proof it to the point that I really had to, had to change so much of it to make sure that it's it's recent and it's it's uh, timely. Um, and like and the last question here: What would a conceptual framework for data justice and fair use of AI in higher education look like? And for this presentation, I can add a fourth question here: What would the practical implementation look like? What would be the actual um, practical um, interpretation of the framework and its principles? So that's a little bit about the background for this work. And um, I don't want to I, I don't want to spend too much time talking about, you know, giving you definitions and discussing all the different research that's going on in this area, which is you know vast. And I'm sure you you're all um, mostly up to date on these things. But I think some definitions are important. And so when I talk about AI, primarily these days I'm referring to Gen AI, generative AI, because it is a game changer, and it is the thing that is affecting us all um, a lot. So as you would know the main difference uh, between the two things, as you can see from some definitions here, is that Gen AI can produce artifacts that look very human-made, and sometimes it's very hard to distinguish which which ones were written by humans and which were not. So it, it doesn't have to be just text; it could be visuals, it could be other outputs. Um, and even though AI has been in, in our lexicon in higher education for more than three decades. It's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. It was already here. Um, and possibilities of what it can give us are endless. And so are the risks. So are the challenges that come with it. And like I'm going to argue in this presentation, the governance of, uh, of this industry is a key priority. It remains a key priority. And universities are working on it. It's a work in progress and for us as well at Swinburne. So um, let's move on. Um, Again, I won't talk too much about all the different possibilities of AI because I'm sure you'll have some understanding of it and perhaps you are using it already in your in your daily life somehow in your teaching and learning. And there's been a lot of different research uh, writing about it, reviewing the literature, 
uh, coming up with different typologies of how we interact with these systems, how we use them, how they affect us as educators, how they affect our students. So, you know, here are some examples. AI can be your collaborative coach. It can motivate. It can help you assess. It can help you co-design things. It can automate some aspects of our work and maybe free up some um, some time to you know how to do other things like research perhaps um, it uh, it can you know understand student behavior um, in the way learning analytics are doing it and try to indicate their um, academic outcomes so possibilities are all over the place they are not just in digital learning they are in administration they're in support uh, they're in all aspects of higher education kind of like um, permeate in uh, different aspects of our of our work in different ways so possibilities are endless but um, how about some paradoxes before we move on to risks so this is uh, coming from a work uh, that i've published recently with my colleagues from management and business and we we're very curious about how we talk about ai um you know we in higher education and other industries as well and it's like these dualities about it um like gen ai is a friend but it's also an enemy um it's capable it can do anything but also dependent it depends uh, it's only as good as the prompts it depends on how well you can manipulate it it's you know it depends on subjectively on how well you can construct uh, your instructions with it it's accessible it's going to you know make it um very equitable accessible for everybody but at the same time it's restrictive because if it's free now it won't be free forever um it's you know it's it's designed by tech companies and their primary uh, purpose is profit. <laughs> so this, this, these systems are not free even when they are free. Um, and then finally, another, the last paradox that we have explored is Gen AI gets even more popular when we try to ban it. As you know, some universities have uh, introduced uh, bans on AI and even some countries have banned AI. But um, how well is it working? You know, can, is, is it really going to work? And it becomes even more, um, um, more popular and people more likely to try it out if it's uh, prohibited. So I think this is a very interesting way to look at it before we move on to the challenges and risks, uh, which is my next slide. Um, like I said, opportunities are endless, but so are the risks and challenges. So again, you probably are familiar with this or some of this, you know, we're dealing with big challenges to academic integrity, plagiarism, because if Gen AI can create artifacts that are indistinguishable from those created by humans, then what is it, you know, what does it mean for assessments? What does it mean for student work? Um, challenges in accessibility and equity. If some students can afford to buy subscription to better systems, what does it tell us about students who can't? Um, and then, of course, there is a lot of issues around um, profiling um, use, while using data collected from users, cognitive bias that come with, with the systems, with this algorithm, surveillance. There are you know, serious issues about automated proctoring, for example, online tracking that can discriminate against um, people who are neurodivergent or people who wear uh, head coverage and things like that. Um, and these systems are so rapidly evolving that it's very hard, so, uh, very hard to regulate. Like I said, lack of regulation is a serious issue um, and various risks um, that are associated with this um, have to do with misuse of data, exploitation of personal information for students and staff, uh, issues of discrimination, digital redlining that um, come, come with this, um, issues of who owns uh, intellectual property, who owns ideas. Um, so if we ask our students to interact with these systems, you know, who in the end is the author, who is in the end of the owner of this um, idea? and various legal implications for workloads uh, for academic staff that can potentially affect our um, enterprise bargaining agreements, as we call them in Australia and in some other countries. So as you can see, regulation and governance are very important. So I'll keep going. And like I said, I um, don't see um, I don't see the chat. So if there are any burning questions that you want to ask, please feel free to interrupt or put them in the chat. I'll, I'll read them. Uh, later, but I'll for now I'll keep talking and hopefully hopefully you're following along because I can't see your face unfortunately. But um, 
I'm getting to the point where I'm about to start talking to you about my framework that I'm proposing uh, to uh, help universities govern this rapidly evolving technology. So these are the main um, lens, um, scholarly lens that I'm using to inform my work. So as you can see, uh, the work that I, the framework that I'm proposing uh, sits uh, on the next at the nexus of data justice research, ethics of care. Um, matters of equity and protection of data, protection of your uh, digital privacy and prevention of exploitation of this data. So all these different bodies of knowledge come together to inform my work. Um, some of the current issues also um, that affect this, and I think they also affect the way we try to uh, implement these principles in the practical sense. Uh, and this is something that we are uh, we are currently working through at, at my workplace um, because uh, one of these issues is that um, current academic integrity policies, which uh, kind of where uh, logically any kind of AI governance language will sit, at the moment they often lack specific and direct language and the principles are not very clearly defined. So over, overall, uh, these policies kind of tend to be underdeveloped and that's an issue because we're trying to introduce introduce something very specific um, into this already kind of a vague policy space. Um, another interesting uh, kind of complication here is that often the, um, the choice uh, of usage and how it's used, often it falls on individual academics and people who are actually in the classroom making decisions. And uh, how can we help? How can we help them make better decisions? Because whether or not what we mandate the use of AI platforms, often academics are the ones who have to deal with it and uh, make decisions on the spot. And uh, finally, it's a very, very big um, issue uh, has to do with data and privacy is that often the consent of students and staff is implied, but it's never fully informed, very rarely fully informed. And um, students remain pretty much unaware and staff as well of what kind of data generated by their actions uh, is gathered, how is it used, who is using it, and how they can opt out. So when I'll be talking about the issues of pr practical implementation of these principles, um, to give people a right to opt out is actually uh, quite, a, <laughs> quite a difficult thing to do. Um, it's, a, it's a design issue, but also in a practical sense, it's not an easy thing to do, but in an ideal world, there should be an option to opt out. Um, and um, all of this is resulting in the framework that I'm proposing uh, to govern AI in higher education. So here it is, uh, which uh, the uh, co-editors of, uh, of the book in which this chapter appears helped me uh, visualize. Uh, so I, 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 thanked, uh, I, thank, I thank them for their help. Um, as you can see, this is... Um, pyramid where at the, at the foundation of it, we have the social justice scholarship um, in higher education and also outside of higher education in general. Then we have AI and data justice as the next step. Then we have ethics of care. Um, and then on top of that, we have the actual principles and the governance and policy sits at the very top. So here, here it is. And I'll talk about the principles next, but um, Here's the main kind of conceptualization of my thinking here when I when I think about what a data justice framework would look like for AI and higher education. Here are the components of it. Now let's talk about principles. Um, and I'll try not to read too much from the screen because I can share the slides with you. But basically, uh, these principles are a synthesis of various recommendations, various research, various uh, literatures that have been developed by scholars and practitioners in not just in higher education, but in other industries that have um, come, that have progressed a lot more in this area compared to higher education, but I think we're catching up now. Um, and my, you know, in, in the ideal world, universities use these principles when developing their own institutional policies that take into account their, their individual context of their universities. Um, but the main kind of main idea behind these principles is that implementation of AI is fair, that is transparent, and that is just. Um, so you can see transparency. Uh, can be operationalized by offering upfront information to students and staff about what that is collected, how it is used. 
clarity is another principle. And this is something that's very important, I believe, to spell out the rationale for why we are using AI in the classroom, uh, why we're asking our students to engage with it. So, you know, is it a pedagogical rationale? It has to be very clear um, why 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 we're doing this. So uh, we need to explain in the very in the plain language why this data is collected, why we ask your students to engage with the systems. No harm is another principle, and that needs to be embedded into all AI designs um, measures that measures against harmful profiling, uh, exploitation of their data. Um, agency is another principle. Um, we need to allow students and staff and you know, other stakeholders to exercise their right to opt out um, in an ideal world, if possible, and to even withdraw their data without prejudice. And finally, um, one of the last principles is active governance. And this is something that is very important because of how rapidly these systems are evolving. So the, the way we handle governance of the systems also need to be very agile. It can be static. So for example, um, a dedicated committee, perhaps an ethics subcommittee could be, set up, could be set up as one potential model, could be populated by members of the public or, or you know, combined with academics and students and um, experts to help solve of issues that arise on a daily basis um, or um, create some kind of working group that we have currently at my university. So um, it needs to be um, a very active system of governance set up to uh, catch up with the two, um, basically be ahead of this, uh, of these developments. And finally, the last principle is accountability. So uh, we always need to think about uh, do benefits outweigh the risks uh, that we envisage? And what would be the mitigation strategy? Uh, how can we put the strategies in place? Um, and uh, what kind of reporting process can be put in place to uh, ensure that we're accountable and we're transparent in our decision? So here are the principles. And um, in the last part of the presentation, um, I will tell you what we're currently doing and how these principles are translating into practical decisions and what are the challenges we're facing. So um, I'll move on unless there are any burning questions at this point, uh, but I'll just go to the next slide. Um, I know um, I know it's, it's, it's very difficult for me not to see faces because if there was some question I would be able to, um, I would be able to engage, but I don't see you. So uh -huh, I'll move on and interrupt me at any point. So lessons from Swinburne. Um, and I, I'm glad my colleagues are listening because um, they're all involved in this. We're all doing this together. So uh, we're developing a set of a set of recommendations for our, our, our academic staff who are about to go and um, teach and deal with these issues, deal with AI in our classrooms. So uh, this is specifically for course and unit teams uh, who are considering maybe using AI in their teaching and learning, maybe in assessments, uh, considering the effect of gene AI in their assessments. So um, outside of the scope, so we're not um, looking at using gene AI for the creation of student facing materials, for example, or curriculum core design. So it's important to set up the scope for this. Um, and this document is guided by the principles of TEXA, which is our Australian uh, tertiary education quality and standards agency that also came up with its own principles to help um, to help academics, to help universities manage this issue. So um, this document has different aspects, uh, different parts to it. So for example, these are like general principles that we're, that we're developing. So for example, like I mentioned in, the, um, in my framework that any use of Gen AI and the rationale for doing so should be very clearly stated in the documents that students can access. In our case, it could be syllabus, unit outline, and ethical privacy information needs to be included. And unit conveners, and this is very important, these conversations with our students about, uh, about Gen AI, about appropriate use of Gen AI, about inappropriate use of Gen AI, needs to be ongoing. So um, kind of we're leaving it with conveners uh, as a way of, you know, they need to be engaging students in these discussions um, as, as needed. Um, another one that is coming directly from the framework is that the choice whether students should use Gen AI tools must be driven by pedagogical rationale, which um, sounds, um, sounds pretty logical to me. Um, but we felt it was very important to articulate it. And it also needs to be linked to appropriate learning outcomes. So if we're asking students to engage with the systems, 
why are they doing this in the context of their units? Uh, how is this going to help them achieve the goals in the unit? Um, the use of Gen AI must be aligned with their um, uh, with their appropriate domains. So what I mean here by, by this, if there are skills that we're asking our students to develop in this particular unit or degree, like collaboration, teamwork, then uh, the use of Gen AI needs to be aligned with that. Um, Another aspect of this, if we're preparing students for a particular profession, and that profession demands that these days graduates possess specific Gen AI related skills, then that's appropriate to use Gen AI in that way in the unit for students to develop the skills before they get uh, to the to work before they basically enter the uh, the workplace. Uh, I mean, this is an obvious one, uh, kind of for us, that we, if we're asking students to use these systems, they sh these sh systems should be available to them through our official university supported um, domains. So unless there's a strong pedagogical rationale um, not to, but students never should be asked to pay for this service. That's a matter of equity and everybody should have equal access. Um, this is kind of I mentioned uh, earlier, but the use of Gen AI in any context needs to be aligned with relevant industry use and uh, ensure that students acquire relevant skills and develop uh, Gen AI literacy that is required in the workplace. And lastly, there has to be um, kind of a wholesome approach to how we um, are asking students to engage with the system. And uh, there needs to be a consistent course approach taken. That way we can ensure that students are developing relevant skills and engaging with relative, uh, with engaging with um, relevant aspects uh, of their learning in a consistent way throughout the entire degree. Now, another uh, part of it is how uh, Gen AI is used in assessed materials. That's a whole different section of this guidance uh, document that we're developing at the moment. So obviously we're saying to students that you cannot present Gen AI generated work as your own, whether it's in whole or in part, and that includes paraphrased materials and any outputs of Gen AI should be acknowledged. We're currently developing a specific um, language that can be added to our course outline, to the unit outline that conveners, academics can use when they communicate to their students how AI is going to be used in this particular unit. So um, that is going to be very clearly spelled out um, and this is within the academic in, uh, integrity policy. Um, Another one. So if we're asking um, students to generate an artifact with the use of uh, AI, uh, the rubric criteria for this assignment should emphasize the creation of the artifact, not the artifact itself that's being created with the Gen AI system. So, for example, um, that way the focus will remain on learning. So we're, we're going to evaluate how students used um, the system for making, editing, evaluation, um, and look at it in a holistic way rather than just the artifact. And that way, the focus remains on the learning um, outcome. Uh, this way, uh, developmental rubrics will be very useful uh, in these types of assignments. Um, next, um, next aspect here, um, perhaps if we're asking students to engage with the systems, and like I said earlier, um, Gen AI produces things as good as the prompts you give them. So should we then be uh, educating our students on uh, how to interact with the systems, how to create prompts that uh, make sense, that create the best, um, create the best results. And uh, that way, uh, if the output of the Gen AI can have a meaningful impact on the quality of student submission, then we need to make sure we train students that upskill them in that regard. So that's something needs to be embedded in the learning in the unit. And um, this is my this is my thinking. I know we're discussing kind of the practical aspect of this, but ideally students should be given an option to opt out um, of directly using Gen AI. Um, however, I do acknowledge that is it is a difficult thing to do in a practical sense and um, may create a lot of challenges for our conveners, for our educators um, in doing so. Um, perhaps perhaps alternatives could be provided to students, like for example, pre-engineered pre prompts and outputs that they can use in their work. But uh, like I said, uh, the, you know, the, the, the option to opt out from use of Gen AI is actually quite a difficult thing. 
uh, from many different from different different perspectives. And finally, um, on this, um, certain tasks, certain assignments that are considered not resilient against Gen AI. Uh, perhaps should not be considered for a major summative assessment. Um, and I don't want to go too much into, you know, assessment aspect because it's a whole different presentation, whole different area of scholarship. And I'm not, um, I'm, I'm talking about governance of AI and um, this is slightly different, but perhaps um, some um, some types of assessment need to be rethought. So um, assessments like uh, summarizing a topic, uh, or you know, an online quiz or a general reflection, they could be quite um, difficult to make. So we need to think of ways to make them resilient against uh, Gen AI, um, and we need to make sure uh, how we can align them closely with other assessment approaches and the unit you know, learning outcomes. Now there are a lot of resources that exist already about uh, making your assessment more resilient and uh, future proofing it against Gen AI. And I have shared those um, with the organizers so you can access those links and have a look. Now, um, nearing the end of the presentation and then it's question time. So um, this is the last kind of aspect of the document uh, that we're currently developing uh, in time for the semester start uh, in the end of the month. So this is a very important aspect of it. So responsible and ethical use of AI. And what you'll find um, in uh, a lot of current scholarship we're talking about is that this kind of education, this raising awareness amongst our students about um, ethical issues surrounding AI needs to come hand in hand with any um, kind of aspects of using AI in your teaching and learning, asking students to you know, use it for various tasks in the classroom. So students need to be educated about ethics and limitations of Gen AI. And that includes um, a lot of things uh, like various biases that come with the systems, discrimination, uh, data hallucination that AI can create, security of your data, um, use of your data without consent, many other concerns uh, around this. And uh, regardless of how we use AI in our unit, um, in our teaching and learning, we also need to remind our students and ourselves about inappropriate uses of, of AI, of Gen AI. And of course, you know, that relates to the issues of plagiarism and what we call contract cheating. And all this information needs to be communicated to students um, uh, along other uh, aspects of university academic integrity policy. So here are the practical implications. And this is this is a work in progress. Um, my colleagues in the room can maybe speak a little bit to that because they have all been involved um, in this document and it's not it's not uh, finished yet, but we're getting close, um, getting close to getting it ready to release uh, to our conveners uh, that are waiting to, waiting for this document to help to help them basically navigate this journey. Um, but where where to next in this work for me and um, for other scholars? Um, like I said in concluding in concluding remarks here, what I want to leave you with is that because these systems, AI systems, develop and mature very quickly, we need to make sure that uh, policy and regulation is also um, quick on its feet. That we need to go beyond the catch-up mode and try to basically govern for something that's developing super fast. Um, this uh, the way to achieve this maybe is to have a cyclical process adopted for the governance um, for this governance uh, framework. And we need to make sure that we allow for changes and amendment, amendments and clarifications to come um, to come as more information becomes available. And we need to be thinking on our feet and potentially changing, uh, changing our guidelines as we know more, as we learn more, as we become more experienced in this. Um, so agile advisory bodies are a must to have um, in place in universities. And of course, um, as, as, as any scholar, I will tell you that we need more. We need more research, we need more evidence, we need more evidence-based findings uh, to help advocate for meaningful adoption ethical principles of the systems in teaching and learning. And another important aspect that uh, we will be working on in my university, I will be involved, um, my colleagues will be involved, this PD is professional development and upskilling of our staff and students. And this is something we currently, um, 
you know, don't have, and we're working on developing different resources and offerings to help educate our academics since, you know, we're expecting them to engage with these things. And some already are, some have been engaged and using these systems in their teaching and learning. Um, and we're here to help, um, to help everyone get to the level where they can do it more uh, impactfully and meaningfully. And I will leave you with this concluding sentence from my chapter, which I hope you will maybe read um, after this. And this is something that kind of the answer to my question, can, can AI be used for good in higher education? So here's my answer in the end of the chapter. If universities are truly serious about their mission statements, centering student experience, then a data justice framework for AI in, in higher education is non-negotiable. Um, currently, the use of AI in higher education is not always for good. Um, and that's why vigilance is essential. And it's important to call out risks and problems like we are doing now. At the same time, uh, the extraordinary power of AI can also be harnessed for good. And such opportunities deserve equal attention and resourcing so that AI can serve the ends of social justice and education. So that's my that's my kind of concluding, um, concluding summary uh, of my work. You can see some uh, references when I share the slides with you. And I hope this was useful to you. And uh, now we have a bit of time for questions. So I might stop. I might stop sharing, so I can hopefully see your faces and see if there are any questions. Oh, well, thank you, thank you, Katya. Uh, that was really uh, great. We have to start with. We have a question from Catherine, but uh, Cronin, and I'm thinking that I, uh, if you are able, just pick the the she, yes, just speak to your question so that. Uh, it's more interactive. Thank you. Over to you, Catherine. Okay. Um, hi, I might hi go. Katia. Oh, hi, hi, Catherine. <laughs> Good to <laughs> see you. Do see you want to say something first? <laughs> no, no, just because I can't see you, so I, I don't know. So please tell, please ask me a question. I can see your question in the chat, So, okay, but please okay. talk to me. <laughs> uh, well, it's actually lovely to hear you share your ideas and expand on them, because as you described, we worked very closely together on your chapter, but you've done so much more than just your chapter, and it's lovely to hear about the work in the context of your institution. So yeah, the, the item I wrote in the chat, I wrote as you were speaking, but um, I, I was just keen to know what the particular challenges were. That was one question in terms of implementing. And the second question was, um, who's involved in this group that you spoke about who are developing um, the guidelines yeah. and you know, are there students involved? Are there, you know, or student representatives and, and how you're managing that? Because um, I can imagine that student voice is very important. Yes, thank very. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your question. And I just I want to again um, emphasize how I greatly appreciate uh, your and Laura's work on my chapter. You really helped me tease out a lot of these uh, important messages that I was trying to communicate in this work. Um, but yeah, thank you for your questions. I mean, I'll I'll do uh, I'll answer the one about uh, the challenges and the, the lessons first. And I think the main kind of lesson and the challenge is that principles and kind of ideal world scenarios don't always translate as um, as well and as seamlessly into practice as we hope. Um, and I think the, the big example here is uh, kind of uh, the, the issue around opting out and giving students that option not to engage with the systems at all on you know whatever grounds, moral grounds, or um, if they don't want to do it. So that, that has proven, um, I think it's going to prove impossible in our case because um, that is an issue of, um, it's just, it's just impractical. It's just, it's proven to be impossible. And I think that's, that's the main challenge, that's the main challenge. And, but so far I, I have found that the principles have been kind of, um, lending themselves well to practical implementation. But again, I talk right now from the theoretical perspective because we haven't actually trialed any of this because the semester hasn't started. So we don't know yet how academics find it useful or not, uh, how they're going to implement this in their classrooms. But hopefully next time I'll talk about this topic, maybe in six months time, I can talk about the actual issues of practical implementation, which I'm sure there's going to be some. And also have some colleagues in the room, like um, Kelly, if you want to add anything, do interrupt, because uh, you've been involved in this work as well. 
Um, but another um, another question from Catherine was about the systems we currently have in place, the groups. So there are two groups that I'm aware of that I'm part of. One is um, academic integrity poll, uh, academic integrity working group, that um, consists of uh, professional and academic staff, and it has discipline discipline leaders from different schools. Um, but I don't think. I'm not sure if it has any students. If there are, they don't come to meetings. So um, I don't think we have any students involved, unfortunately. But that group is uh, working on, for example, developing an AI statement for our unit outline, um, compliance module uh, that's been uh, developed for our students that informs them about various issues of academic integrity and Gen AI issues. So that group is doing its work, but we also have a more informal community of practice uh, in AI that um, uh, another colleague of mine is is running. So that one pretty much welcomes um, anyone. Uh, it's more about exchanging experiences, um, that group. So yeah, um, I agree students need to be more involved in this. <laughs> um, we all right. have a uh, hand up from Paul this... Alphonse. Your question. Go ahead, Paul. Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> well, look at the chat. You're on mute. We can't hear you, Paul Alphonse. Please unmute yourself. We are not able to hear you. Please unmute yourself, please. I see you're joining us from your phone. Yes, there you go. <laughs> yes, you hear me? Yes, 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 go on now. Okay, can the ARB be used in the sample processing in the medical laboratory as well as on the training medical students? Can it be used? Can AI be used to train medical students? Yes. Is that the question? I I think so. I would imagine so. Um, I don't have an example that comes from a, a medical, from medical education, but I do. I can think of many other examples from um, design, for example, from teaching and learning. Um, Again, I don't come necessarily from medical <laughs> medical background, but implications of AI can be used for you know simulation, for example, uh, for engaging students in um, anatomy lessons, for example. Like I know at Swinburne, uh, we have a very um, developed kind of augmented reality uh, training for a medical uh, for for a nursing students that involves. Uh, interaction, you know, with, with human body, with organs, through um, through through that system. But again, I'm I'm not really expert in that, but I'm sure you can use AI in, in laboratories. If someone else has experience from that area, Kelly, I, I see your hand is up. I hope you have an answer from yeah, medical hello. science. <laughs> I'm thank thank you. I I would love to respond a little bit to Paul and just to say thank you so much, Katya. I'm very blessed to be working with Katya on this and working with her framework, which is really exciting. Um, I have had experience with medical uh, education and also um, I've been a health practitioner myself and in learning design with, with, um, with uh, health science and medical education, but I was actually in an AI and education symposium today where they talked quite a bit about using AI with um, medical students in the for in the sense that I mean, there's lots of um, possibilities, but one that I found there was a big appetite for was helping students um, develop their clinical reasoning development and their feeling of confidence in asking questions and interacting with different kind of um, patients, clients and scenarios. So they were creating particular case scenarios and avatars with AI to be able to um, present situations, virtual situations where they would need to respond before going into particular simulations even uh, with other peers and also into actual practical environments. So they were having some very positive responses with that. They even showed a avatar response where there was a very aggressive um, patient that they had, to t they had to deal with in a hospital situation. And I think there's lots of other uh, particular 
experimentation would you like or just applications around diagnostics that are happening and you know trying to work out if there's to unpack information around case scenarios to be able to do that in a bit of a co-pilot situation as well as the tutor in group scenarios and problem-based learning so there was a bit of that you know um examples that were happening today as well. So I thought they were two really interesting areas in terms of medical information that was happening today. Um, but I also wanted to say, Katia, I think your framework um, has such a, and coming back to Catherine's question, has a real application with working with students in the you know if students come into those spaces in those committees which we know we're really wanting to generate more and research but even showing them that framework and saying how they feel about those particular steps and and that this is this is the um you know there, there is a sequence that we're working towards I think would be really um, empowering for students as well so I think there's a lot of exciting opportunity with that too and particularly around that agile element of that that you know committees and having more um, as we know there's a lot of processes and structures within universities but being able to you know, break that up a little bit, if you like, to have a little bit more pragmatic, you know, opportunities with that would be really interesting as well. I also find that, um, and thank you so much, Kelly, and for the example, because I missed out on the session this morning, um, that was waiting list only, which I unfortunately yeah. didn't get in. So if, I'm glad you went. But I was also going to say, and maybe you have something to add about, you know, the practical implementation and developing the guidelines document together. What I found is that to me, my, the principles in my framework are common sense principles. They're the ones we should be doing, right? That's that's the approach we should be taking for our students coming from the point of, you know, duty of care and, um, you know, ethical understanding and agency. And I, I think we're, we're lucky that in our unit, we share that understanding of what common sense is. And maybe that's what made it a relatively smooth process to develop the principles into practice. Yeah. maybe that's my perception I, I, but yeah. yeah and I think I think having your framework and the principles gives it a really nice clear foundation to begin from that you can mm. sort of you can quite you know perhaps with more ease start to um, brainstorm some of the practicalities and the logistics of how would that come into play how would we see that in practice and then we came up with a couple of hurdles with that too but and that's not to say they're forever they're just hurdles for the moment it's that sort of pragmatic response again but it it gave that beginning you know a um a starting point that even though they're common sense they're still we need those frameworks we need that foundation to start because it's such a big area and it can get so overwhelming that you know this is a way that we can begin that conversation that dialogue across stakeholders across the university and that that's where we really want to get that collective voice in I think so um, yeah. but I think you're in that I think for me and maybe this is my, my, I loved, I actually have to say, I love your narrative form of how you did the <laughs> chapter, because I, I actually think that is what we need to encourage more, more, more academics, more students, more educators, more professional staff to actually think through in a narrative lens. Um, we could probably mm. get some really rich information that way. But um, yeah, yeah the, the issue, the, the element of care in your ethical framework too, I think is it really stands out. It's a little bit different to, I don't always see care explicitly mentioned in all sorts of frameworks. And I think that makes it, <laughs> brings in the human aspect as well, which um, is quite, um, yeah, is, is important, I think. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm glad you're in the room. So you, you can help, you could help me. Um, I'm just, <laughs> thank you so much. I just, I want to see, uh, there's another question here in the chat from Nic Nicola. Um, I don't know if Nicola, if you want to say it yourself or I can, I can read from here, but basically the question is, what are you, what am I finding? What are we finding from, what are we hearing from educators? So actually we're not hearing anything from educators yet because this uh, guidance document hasn't gone out yet to the educators. It's currently still 
um, being kind of reviewed by our senior leaders. And we are working together, you know, with Kelly, with our boss, with others in our team. We're still working on um, kind of tweaking it and finalizing it. But I think because the semester is starting at the end of the month, it's going to go out to, it's going to be, um, what's the word, uh, socialized uh, in uh, to our academic staff very shortly. And that's when we're going to start hearing back from them. Um, and, you know, um, I'm thinking as a researcher that there is definitely an interesting project here to evaluate how effective um, these guidelines are and how academics are finding them. So, um, Unfortunately, not, nothing yet. Uh, the only findings we're having is just between ourselves, kind of what Kelly was talking about, what I was talking about in terms of challenges and how we're approaching them in um, articulating the principles of the network, of the framework into uh, the guidelines. Um, but we haven't heard from the, you know, the main recipients of the, gui of the guidelines yet, but uh, we will, and then we'll, then we'll know. Um, but, um, but yeah, so also Nic Nicola is saying that indeed students, educators, and those supporting them are all overwhelmed. And how we deal with this is probably part of the larger challenge. Yes, absolutely. It is overwhelming. And if you um, if you go to any conference in higher education and teaching learning these days, I mean, there's so much going on and uh, people are talking about, you know, AI, uh, how it's affecting assessment, how it's affecting student writing, how it's affecting students' critical skills, so many different areas. And I, I talk about governance, but it's, it's, you know, it's difficult to kind of um, separate that from other, um, from other aspects. Um, AI is affecting every aspect of our work and we'll continue to do so. so. Yeah. So any, um, do we have time for another question? If anybody wants to say something or comment, <laughs> critique, or will accept critiques. Yes, <laughs> yes we, we do have five more minutes. And uh, Nicola had said that she would uh, say more. Probably we can give her a minute. Please do. So. Yeah. Yes, please. Nicola. Well, thank you, Irene. And thank you, Katya, for your very interesting presentation. I think it was so useful also just to contrast um, what I'm doing at our university, Rhodes University in South Africa, and been working with colleagues to support lecturers and students and developing various guidelines and running workshops. And there is that sense of people definitely feeling overwhelmed and how do you design for an uncertain future? And someone once in when said to me when's it going to end <laughs> you know there's all these tools and they're changing and it's so it's like the uncertainty itself is stressful for them and supporting people in a way that is caring um but also informative and in line with you know conversations elsewhere it's it's so tricky um and i think it's just that there's a broader kind of effective side to it is is you know that it's sometimes you feel a bit like a therapist <laughs> like how, the world is changing and and people are it's not it's not necessarily what you're asking them to do but it, but it's the 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 sense of overwhelm that comes with uh when they think about ai uh, i'm not sure if that's something that maybe you you will be experiencing and hopefully uh we'll share more about as well yeah, thank you. I think you just just summarized it really well. We're all feeling it, um, but at the same time, you know, um, I, 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 my, my approach to all this, you know, AI is like it, it is a major, it's, it's a major uh, upheaval in higher education. But at the same time, it happened before. Like uh, my my boss and our director of our unit, they're mathematicians, and they like to bring example of when calculators came into <laughs> mathematics and how everybody was completely stressed out and think it's going to, you know, people are gonna forget how to count and it's gonna destroy everything. And and then, you know, it's okay. Calculators are still here. Mathematics is still here. We still know how to count. So it was a big upheaval at the time, but then it kind of smoothed out, I guess. Um, and I'm always, I'm, I'm a proponent of, of a calm approach. It's good to take your time to think. You don't have to make decisions on the spot. I mean, sometimes you do, but it's also it's good to, to take time and reflect on things. And I found that some universities, you know, even in Australia, around the world, they reacted very differently to this, right? And some just jumped on it and said, yeah, use it. Uh, everybody can use it in any way. Um, see what happens. And some universities just banned it, said you can't use it in any way. It will, you will be punished if you do. But I think in our university, we took, uh, we took a very 
wise approach perhaps because we took our time to think about it and now that we have learned more about this um we have now our response and our response is these guidelines to our academics um to our educators and uh, hopefully our time of quiet contemplation on the topic will transfer on to our teachers, to our educators as they go into their, this semester. We know they have been using AI in some ways, like they used a lot in, dis, in design discipline, for example, when they ask students to visualize the prototypes and, and use, um, use AI uh, image generators just as um, like to create outputs and trial their ideas and see what doesn't work. So they've been using it for some time, but I think now we're at the, now we're at the point where we know enough to make informed decisions about it, at least to the point of what we know at this time. So, but yeah, I mean, sense of overwhelm is very typical and we live in the times of cost and change. We still haven't recovered fully from the pandemic. Um, everybody's exhausted and we are working with very, very tired um, people. <laughs> so we need to tread carefully and respectfully and apply the duty of care to our academics as well as our students. Maybe that's my, I guess, response. I hope it <laughs> makes sense. But thank you. Uh, thank you. There's there's um a a a, a, um, um, a comment by Kelly who says embracing the messiness of higher education and uh, generative AI seems to be the features key feature skill to foster. I think so too. Um, uh, but he's he's also asking about uh, your front cover of the book, the image that you've used. Um, oh, Catherine should answer that. If Catherine's still in the room, <laughs> hopefully you are. Yeah. Oh, I'm not sure if Catherine I, has left. She's there. She's there. I, I am still in the room, but I, I don't want to pretend to take uh, responsibility for your good work, Katya. I saw that we were just uh, supporting you, asking you questions, you know, to guide the development of the framework. Um, your, it was all your work in terms of the principles and the ethical approach and the data justice approach. So is, is it the image that the question is about, the pyramid? Yeah, the, the cover, the art on the cover of the book, I think Kelly wanted to know about it because it's a beautiful oh, is that, um, is, artist. Is it the, isn't it the cover image? Is that it, Kelly? Yes. I was I was really drawn to the cover image because it instantly, it was how the feeling is of being mm. in that uncertain rapid journey. And I mm. thought, what a wonderful cover. So it was just a, a last minute question is, who? how did you come to the cover image? I loved it. <laughs> uh, well, I, the, the cover image is by an absolutely wonderful artist named George Spugaras. Oh. And we invited artwork in the book. Um, yeah. And that piece of art is not only on the cover, um, but also inside the book. And every piece of artwork in the book is accompanied by an artist's reflection. So oh, George, that's, that's, I recommend you. that you just have a look at that. It's the it's the yeah. first artwork in the book and he writes the story of it. And it's, it's about his own family's um, refugee experience okay. and observing other refugee experiences it's very moving thank you thank mm. you i was very moved looking at it so thank you you're so welcome and thank you katya i was i was writing that's why i wasn't responding to your question i just found <laughs> it was a very clear presentation i really appreciated it and just bringing to life you know, all of the ideas of your chapter and just the messiness, as Nicola said, of, yeah. of doing this now when, you know, the, um, many people are really struggling and just doing it with care and with a with an ethical and data justice approach. Um, it's it's a wonderful kind of beacon, I think. So thank you. I agree. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Catherine, and, and to Laura for giving me opportunity to write this chapter that um, really kind of served as a launchpad for, uh, launch for me to talk about this. And um, really, I'm, I'm very excited to be working this, in this field right now. And um, I'm, I'm very proud of the work we're doing at Swinburne, and I'm very grateful that I get to talk about it with you today. So thank you for having me. Thank you uh, to Emerge Africa Network. Um, to Irene and other organizers, and I think I think we're at time, so um, I don't think there is time for any more questions. Thank you so much. We've been a wonderful audience. I wish I could see your faces, but I um, I'm I'm very grateful for your questions. And um, if you have any questions for me, or if you just want to be in touch, keep in touch, um, I can share these slides with Irene. She can share them with you. 
Um, and um, you know, you have my email, um, find me on LinkedIn, connect with me, and um, I'm always happy to chat about this and other research topics. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Thank you all very much. And have a wonderful day. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate you. Appreciate your time for coming. Thank you for being the first in the uh, AI in higher education series that we have. We have many more. So if you have time, please join us uh, in the coming days, in the coming two months. We'll have a lot of the AI series. And uh, we appreciate you. If you have another topic, please, we welcome you to come back and, and talk. I will. We appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you everyone <laughs> we always like some feedback i've shared the link please send us your feedback about the session and anything else you'd like to see in this ai series uh, ai series in higher education that we have thank you everyone and have a good day good night and good evening <laughs> bye everyone. bye everybody thank you thank you